السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمد عبد الرسول so uh, the session is going to be a brief session inshallah ta'ala on al-quds some of the virtues of al-quds obviously it is a city it is a masjid that is holy to us and something to pay attention to is that you know there's uh, a push amongst our generation meaning the time that we live in where these concepts that were really considered to be musallamat these were things that were considered to be known of the deen they were part and parcel of the religion have become issues of controversy things that were completely uncontroversial like al masjid al aqsa belongs to the muslims it's part of our theology it is the third holiest city in the muslim world you'll find people even amongst the muslim world talking heads speaking on tv and things like that saying oh that the masjid al-aqsa is not in jerusalem it's somewhere else or al masjid al-aqsa is not a major issue for the muslim world my local masjid is more important than al masjid al-aqsa things that you wouldn't imagine a believer saying and yet these silent thoughts are being spoken out loud and so it's important that on nights like this that we remind each other that we talk about in masjid al-aqsa and that we understand a little bit better the importance that this place has allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says subhana alladhi asra bi 'abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawla so right from the beginning in surah al-isra the first verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said subhan exalted is the one who took his slave on a night's journey from al-masjid al-haram to al-masjid al-aqsa the one that we blessed its surroundings allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selected this masjid allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed this masjid and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says yakhluqu ma yasha'u wa yaqtar allah says allah is the one who creates whatever he wishes and he chooses so a verse says why al-masjid al-aqsa why jerusalem you say because allah chose why Ramadan? Because Allah chose. What makes Ramadan different or more unique than other months? Allah chooses what He wishes. Allah selects which prophet He wishes from amongst the people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selects times and makes them special. The 10 days of the Ijjah are special. The month of Ramadan is special. Laylatul Qadr is special. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who creates and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who chooses. Allah chooses. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Mecca and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Medina and Allah chose Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Al-Quds. Now what does Quds mean? Quds has a number of meanings. Number one, it means sanctified. So it is the sanctified city and it is the sanctified masjid. The angels in Surah Al-Baqarah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa, what did the angels say? Finish the verse for me. قَالُوا أَتَجْعَلُوا فِيهَا مَا يُسْدُوا فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُوا الدِّمَاءُ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّبُهُ بِحَمْدِكَ وَنُقَدِّسُ لَكَ They said, are you going to create on this earth those who are going to spill blood and make mischief while we, while we praise you and we نُقَدِّسُ لَكَ They use the same word. We sanctify you. And so Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa means the place or Al-Quds is the sanctified city. It is the sanctifying. It is the holy city. So it is sanctified. It is Baytul Maqdis and it is Al Baytul Muqaddas. Muqaddas means it is sanctified. Maqdis means it is sanctifying. So it purifies those who go there and worship there and it is purified in and of itself. It is the holy land. But Quds also has another meaning and it's very, very beautiful and it's very profound. And that is Baraka. Baraka. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being Al-Quddus means he is the one who is the owner of blessings. Baytul Maqdis or Al-Ard Al-Muqaddasa means not just the holy land, but it is the blessed land. How is it blessed? How is Al-Quds blessed? How is Asham blessed? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he doesn't say, he says, الَّذِي بَارَكْنَا حَوْلَهُ He says the city or the, the masjid that we have blessed its surroundings. And the surroundings is that entire region. And you heard the four countries that are now considered to be the Levant or Asham, and that is Jordan and Lebanon and Syria and Palestine. That entire region is blessed. It's blessed how? Tell me some of the ways that it's blessed. 
Excellent. The amount of prophets that came there, one prophet after another, prophet after another. So many of these names that you heard, they were either from Asham or they migrated to Asham. Ibrahim migrates to Asham. Musa migrates to Asham. You have all of these great prophets that are from Asham, Dawood and Sulaiman and Yusuf and Yaqub and I mean so many. And the ones we don't know are way more than the ones that we know. What else? Yes. It's people, okay? What about it's people? Is it just a flex? I'm from Lebanon. What about it's people? What about the people of Asha? Okay, what else? Huh? The notable people? Look at the amount of scholars that have come out of, of, of Asha. A lot of these names that you've heard of Ibn uh, Hajar, Al Asqalani. Where's Asqalan? Gaza. And the Prophet Sallallahu says, خَيْرُ رِبَاطِكُمْ The best of your ribat is the ribat of Asqalan. That's Gaza. Uh, although he lived his entire life from, from Egypt, in Egypt, he's from Asqalan. Imam al nawi is from Asham. Ibn Taymiyyah is from Asham. Uh, Imam uh, Ibn Al-Qayyim, of course, is from Asham. Ibn Qudam Al-Maqdisi is from Asham. Anytime you hear Al-Maqdisi, Abdul Ghani Al-Maqdisi, Ibn Qudam Al-Maqdisi, Al-Maqdisi is where? Jerusalem. A lot of these heavyweight scholars that we quote every single day, we're from Asham. The amount of scholars that come from Asham. It's blessed in its fruits. It's blessed in the amount of revelation that came down in Asham. It's blessed in the amount of martyrs that come out of Asham. The Prophet said that it is Ard Ribat until the Day of Judgment. You know what Ard Ribat means? That it is constantly going to be a place of conflict. And how can it not when three of the world's greatest religions all lay claim for it? until the Day of Judgment, whether it's the Crusades or whether it's present day or whether it's the future, at the end. All of that is taking place in Asham. And so the amount of martyrs that come, are selected, are chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that region, I would not be surprised if a significant portion of on the Day of Judgment, the Ummah Shuhada are all from Asham, like a, a, a healthy percentage. Even if it's 5 or 10% or 15%, it's still a very healthy percentage. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But that's also selection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِي بَارَكْنَا حَوْلَهُ Now, Bayt al-Maqdis, as you saw in the map um, by Kabir, it's different than al-Masjid al-Haram. Al-Masjid al-Haram is the actual masjid. When you go to the Haram, you pray in the masjid. You go inside the masjid and you're trying to, that's where you pray, that's where you get rewarded. Masjid al-Nabawi, same thing, you go inside the masjid. Masjid al-Nabawi, you don't even pray in the courtyard if you can avoid it unless it's spilling out. You go into the masjid to pray. However, Al-Masjid al-Aqsa, it is the entire complex. It's the entire complex. It's 144,000 uh, square meters. So when you see the complex and you see these, you know, emails or WhatsApp messages and things like that, where they point to the Dome of the Rock and they say, this is not in Masjid Al-Aqsa, and they point to in Masjid Al-Qibli and they say, this is in Masjid Al-Aqsa. In reality, the 144,000 square meter complex, the entire place is in Masjid Al-Aqsa. So when you zoom in on the entire complex, I want you to know that everything that is within that boundary all of that is in Masjid al-Aqsa and that's very, very important. And this is not just because of the occupation. This was always held that all of that is in Masjid al-Aqsa. But it became even more important during the occupation. Why? Is because they really, really, really want any part of the Masjid. And so if the Masjid is deemed or any part of it is deemed, oh, this is not in Masjid al-Aqsa, they'll say, great, so let's, let's have that. So you're saying it's not in Masjid al-Aqsa, right? And that's why it's very interesting. When you've actually gone there, I noticed, and alhamdulillah, we've taken a number of trips there, and we ask Allah Azza wa that our next trip be with Palestine free. Allahumma ameen. So you go there and you learn new fiqh, the fiqh of occupation, because certain things just didn't make sense. And you learn very quickly to just kind of humble yourself and just ask questions and you'll learn things. Like for example, you have in Masjid al-Qibli, which is this, you know, let's say this is in Masjid al-Qibli. The amount of people will be praying in the rows will be two or three rows. One, two, three. Now any masjid in the world you go to, 
If you don't fill up this place, you don't go and pray somewhere else. You fill up this place. This masjid has two, three rows or four rows, and that's completely different than what you experience in Mecca and Medina because in Mecca and Medina, the masjid is packed. Here you're coming to a masjid al-Aqsa and it's empty. It's very saddening because most people aren't given permits to be able to pray there. And so you have some locals from Al-Quds who are allowed to pray there. And even them, many of them are advanced in age. And then you have people who are foreigners. They're coming and they're praying there. Long story short, Al-Masjid, uh, the Dome of the Rock, Masjid Al-Sakhra, is maybe, I want to say like a, a two minute walk away. And that has its own jama'ah. They have their own congregation for Dhuhr and Asr and Maghrib. And you'd think to yourselves, why wouldn't you close that masjid and come move your congregation to pray here, right? Now, who's the genius who can figure out why they do that? Yes, Malik. To keep the claim, 100%. We need every aspect of this masjid to be occupied, the entire complex. So no, you can't have this, we pray here too. No, you can't have that. No, no, we need that too. We pray that too. They're trying to keep it occupied. And so actually when you go to the Masjid Al-Aqsa, because of that idea of we need the Masjid to be occupied all the time, you will find people doing things there that you would never see happening in a Masjid Al-Haram or a Masjid Al-Nabawi. People are coming and they're having their weddings in front of the Masjid and they're doing a photo shoot in front of the Dome of the Rock. Have you ever seen a wedding photo shoot in front of the Dome of the Rock? You might have seen it on Instagram. What allows for a bride to come in her white dress, coming and standing in front of the Dome of the Rock? Could you imagine a bride in a white dress going into a Masjid al-Nabawi and trying to take a photo in front of That would never ever happen. A family coming and having a picnic. Intermural sports of local university students coming and racing on the side of the, uh, you know, one of the grassy areas of a Masjid al-Aqsa. Why do they allow for all of this varied activity to happen? because they want the masjid to be occupied. The mufti of Al-Quds, he signed off on that, he encouraged people, he said, guys, come. If you want to play a soccer game, come play it at the Masjid Al-Aqsa. If you want to have a family picnic, come have it at the Masjid Al-Aqsa. You want to do sports, come do whatever you guys want to do, come and do it at the masjid, keep the masjid occupied. The point here is that all of that complex is considered to be a Masjid Al-Aqsa. Now, you have what's called al-Masjid al-Qibli, the Qibla. It is the structure that is most south because remember, Jerusalem is north of, Me of Mecca. And so the Qibla is actually south. So the Qibli Masjid is the southern uh, Masjid. And then behind it is the Dome of the Rock. And the Dome of the Rock was built by the Khalifa Abdul Malik ibn Murwan. The rock was always there and it's actually a mountain. And so when you're walking up, you're, the highest point of the structure of the complex is where the Dome of the Rock is. Otherwise, you're walking steps up and you're walking steps down. Is this, am I, you guys able to visualize this? Okay. So the Dome of the Rock was built by the Khalifa Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. And people mention that the cause of why he did it are a number of reasons. If you want to give him a, a more... Um, uh, you want to give him basically like a, a better excuse for why he built the Dome of the Rock structure? It is because he looked around and he saw that Jerusalem was a city of incredible extravagance. You heard about how Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah commented on the dress of Umar ibn Khattab. These were people who loved finery, they loved extravagance. And so their churches, until today, if you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you see incredible uh, gold, all sorts of, of wealth being, being, um, being used in the structure of these places. And so if you have these churches that are so grandiose and so much wealth is used to build them, and then you have a little miskeen Masjid al-Qibli, Abdul Malik ibn Muwa is like, no, I want the Muslim's masjid to be as charming, as beautiful, as, as, as much of a landmark in the city than any church. And so he built this beautiful structure, the Dome of the Rock. And until today, whether every, anybody, when they think of the image of Jerusalem, the trademark image is the Dome of the Rock. It's not the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it's the Dome of the Rock. That being said, that's one angle. Another one is 
painting Abdul Malik ibn Muad as more of like a, a shrewd politician. He had a conflict and a challenge to the Khilafah from one of the great companions, Abdullah ibn Zubair. And Abdullah ibn Zubair's stronghold was in Mecca. And Abdullah ibn Zubair has a great advantage. That advantage is, is that Mecca is where everybody's going to come once a year for Hajj. And so he would be able to recruit people when they come for Umrah and when they come for Hajj. And Abdul Malik ibn Murwan does not have that power. He doesn't have anything that will drive people to Asham. In fact, people from Asham are going to Mecca and they're getting recruited by, Abdul, uh, by Abdullah ibn Zubair. That's a political problem. And so what did he do? He built the Dome of the Rock so that he could divert people as well to, uh, to uh, Asham. So that was his political calculus. In any case, the Dome of the Rock is built by Abdul Malik ibn Murwan, and it's a beautiful structure that stands until today. Now, what are some of the virtues of Asham? What are some of the virtues of Bayt al Maqdis, inshaAllah? Number one, we said that it's blessed. Number two, it is a place that has been visited by the prophets and it's been visited by the companions. Umar ibn Khattab makes the journey there. Abu Bayd ibn Jarrah makes the journey there. Salman al Farisi makes the journey there. Abu Dhar makes the journey there. Sa'id ibn Zayd makes the journey there. You have Amr ibn al-As makes the journey there. You have Ubad ibn Samit and Shaddad ibn Us who are actually buried there. And when you go and you visit the masjid, right outside there's the Rahma uh, uh, grave cemetery, right outside the masjid. And you go and you visit and you see the two graves of these two companions, Shaddad ibn Aus and Ab Ubad ibn Samit. Now, also it was the first Qibla of the Muslims, as you know. What was actually the Qibla? When you're in Mecca, I mean, when you're here, you just face Mecca. But when you're in Mecca, you face the Kaaba, right? So no matter which side of the Kaaba you're on, you might be praying north or south or east or west. What was the, actually the Qibla in Jerusalem that the Prophet ﷺ was praying towards for 13 years? 15 years actually, 13 years in Mecca, and then another year and a half in Medina. What was actually the Qibla? When you're in Jerusalem, what was actually the Qibla itself? Does anybody know? What was the Qibla that Bani Israel prayed to? Depending on what side they were on. It's actually the rock. So the rock is the top of the mountain, and it's the highest part. And so depending on where they were, they would pray towards the rock. That was their Qibla. And it was said that that rock was, because it's the highest part of the mountain, that is where the mihrab was of Dawood. And later on, that was where the mihrab was of Zakariya salam. So when Umar ibn Khattab comes to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, he finds that the rock had become turned into a garbage dump because the Christians had already expelled the Jews and they are, you know, to add insult to injury, this is what your qibla was, and we've turned it into a, we've turned it into a, a garbage dump. And so Umar who commands for it to be cleansed, and then he asks his companions, where should we build the masjid? Where should we build the masjid al qibli And so Kaab ibn Ahbar, Kaab al Ahbar, he was Kaab al Ahbar was a Jewish rabbi who accepted Islam, and he's a tabi'i. Kaab says to Umar, he says to him. Amir al-Mu'mineen, build it behind the rock. Let's build the masjid behind the rock. We'll just do it over there. Now again, this is Masjid Qibli. The Qibla is that way. The rock is behind. It's this way. So Kaab is saying, let's build the masjid behind the rock. And what that would mean is that the Muslims are praying towards Mecca, but the rock is still in front of them. And so Umar radiallahu anhu says, to Kaab, he says, you still have some Jewishness in you. <laughs> he says to him, you still have some Jewishness in you. He says, Umar says, no, we're going to build it in front of the rock. Umar, radiallahu anhu, sees the fiqh of Umar. He's like, no, no, khalas, it's changed now. That's not our qibla anymore. Us praying towards the rock now is like us, you know, still celebrating Saturday. Allah has replaced our Saturday with Friday. Khalas, it's done. Old qibla. I was going to say uh, new, new Deen Hudis, right? Just completely replacing the Qibla, completely replacing the, everything changes now. No attachment to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had previously ordained because Allah has replaced us with something that's better. But again, that idea of breaking. Uh, it's Mubarak in the land. It's the 
place of the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Al-Masjid al-Aqsa. It's where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led 124,000 prophets in prayer. It's the da'wah of Musa. Musa alayhi wa sallam, he wandered with Bani Israel in the desert for 40 years. And then when death was approaching him, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he could at least come as close as a stone's throw away from Jerusalem so that he could pass away as close to Jerusalem as possible. And that was because, as Anawi mentioned, that Musa السلام, asked Allah to be as close as possible to Jerusalem because of its virtue and the virtue of the prophets who are all buried there. And also it's, I mean, there's a lot that could be said, but the last thing that I'll mention is that it is one of the three masajid that the Prophet وسلم, told us that you're allowed to religiously travel for. We're not allowed to travel because of believing in the religious virtue of praying in any masjid except for three, Al-Masjid Al-Haram, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, and the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu There's a lot of a hadith that are weak with regards to the virtue of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, but something that's really interesting is that the reason why many authors wrote about the virtues of Al-Sham like Ibn Asakir, he wrote a, a book called Tariq Dimash. Ibn Taymiyyah also wrote a book on the virtues of Asham. And the reason why they did that, Ibn Taymiyyah says, the reason why we did it is to encourage the people of Asham to stand fast with the invasion of the Mongols. That when the Mongols came to Asham, these scholars, they wrote these books to remind the people of Asham, this land is blessed. This land is virtuous. This land is a land of ribat. Stand fast. And so it's really important that even in our times that we also remind each other that this land is blessed. This land is important. This land is a land of ribat. And it's important that we don't give it up and that we encourage those who are there to have patience with the great reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised them. Also, the, the, I forgot to mention that the salah is multiplied. It is multiplied in Bayt al-Maqdis. Famously, al-Masjid al-Haram, it's 100,000. In al-Masjid al-Nabawi, it's 1,000. In al-Masjid al-Aqsa, it's 250. That's the most authentic narration, that it is 250. And the Prophet sallallahu said, وَلَنِعْمَ الْمُصَلَّهُ He said that it is an excellent musalla. Because Abu Dhar asked the Prophet sallallahu and he said, we were mentioning al-Masjid al-Aqsa to the Prophet sallallahu And in fact, we were asking him, which masjid is afdal, al-masjid al-Nabawi or al-masjid al-Aqsa? The Sahaba are sitting there in Medina and they're debating, they're reviewing, and they come and they ask the Prophet, which masjid is better, al-masjid al-Nabawi or al-masjid al-Aqsa? You know what that shows you? That shows you that al-masjid al-Aqsa was already so big in the eyes of the companions. It was something that was so significant. They viewed it, and what's really amazing at least to me, always, is that with all of these virtues and all of these hadith that talk about Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is talking about a place that the companions, that wasn't even Muslim yet. It was not even Muslim. And yet Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is talking about this place like it is part and parcel of the Muslim world and that it is one of the, the central arteries of the Muslim world until the Day of Judgment. He's talking about Asham like he loves this place. That until the Day of Judgment, he says that it is, it is a bastion for the believers. And it's not even Muslim at the time, right? That's incredible prophecy. And the Sahaba, عنه, because of how much they've heard of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, they're asking the Prophet, they're like, actually, which one is better? Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi, the one that you built with your own hands and that we're all here at? Or is it Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa? And the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Salatun fi masjid afdal min arba'a salawat fi. Salah in my masjid is better than four salahs there. And what an excellent musallah it is, it is. And then he says, and there will come a time. And this is a beautiful hadith. He says, there will come a time when a man has what is equal to the rope that you tied down your horse with. Just that little surface area, however much of space that takes, that little rope, he says, of land through which they're able to see Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is better for them than the world and everything in it. For a person to have like one single square foot of land in Jerusalem, through which they're able to see Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa will be more beloved to them than the world and everything in it. And we saw that. 
When we went to Al-Quds, every time we went to Al-Quds, we saw this hadith manifested. Did we not? We saw people who are offered millions of dollars to sell their cafes, like Abu Khadija. $30 million he's offered, and a, and a visa to go anywhere. He's got a little cafe. He doesn't, even, he, he doesn't even have a permit to sell lunch, to sell dinner. He sells breakfast items and that's it. He's not allowed to sell anything else. And he's buried in debt and he's buried in, in taxes and he's buried in mukhalafat, in fines. And he's like, no, I'm not selling. I'm not selling. He's got a little, little store. But it's more beloved to him than the world and everything in it. $30 million? No, I'm not interested. We meet a gentleman who literally has a practice in the United States that's worth like $30 million. Or more. And he was telling us that he instead moved from the U.S. and was living in a one-bedroom apartment in Jerusalem he didn't have a permit to live in Jerusalem. His wife had a permit to live in Jerusalem. And so she would bring him to Al-Quds in the trunk of her car. This guy would be living in mansions in the U.S. But that one square foot through which you're able to see Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is more beloved to them. That one bedroom apartment is better than villas in the United States. I'd rather be brought to and fro in the trunk of my wife's car. But I get to see Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. The Prophet Sallallahu prophecy is true. The fadl of Salah in uh, Masjid Al-Aqsa, I guess there's uh, a beautiful hadith Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi tells us and the hadith is in Ibn Majah. He says that when Sulaiman completed building in Masjid Al-Aqsa, and Sulaiman was not the first person to build in Masjid Al-Aqsa, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which Masjid was built first. He said, Al-Masjid Al-Haram. He said, what Masjid was built after that? He said, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. He said, what's the difference between them? He said, 40 years. And so Allah knows best, there's difference of opinion. Who was the first builder of Al-Masjid Al-Haram and who was the first builder of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa? Was it the angels? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, it was Adam that Adam built both of them and between them was the period of 40 years. And Ibrahim simply rebuilt the Kaaba and Sulaiman rebuilt Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. But the Prophet sallallahu tells us that when Sulaiman rebuilt Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, when he completed, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for three things. First thing he said was, uh, judgment on earth that was harmonious with Allah's judgment on, in the heavens. That Sulaiman's judgment be razor sharp, that it be correct. His judgment on earth be in congruence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's judgment in the heavens. Number two is mulkan la yanbaghi ahadim min ba'dih. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a kingdom the likes that which nobody would ever have after him. And number three, he said that nobody comes to al-Masjid al-Aqsa intending to pray in it except that they leave with their sins being forgiven. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, as for the first two, he was given, and I hope that he was given the third. I hope that he was given the third. Now, near the end of times, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he was asked by Ibn Hawala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, there will come a time when there will be soldiers in Iraq, there will be soldiers in Asham, and there will be soldiers in Yemen. So Ibn Hawala said, Ya Rasulullah, choose for me. Which one should I be a part of? Should I be a part of the army in Iraq, the army of Yemen, or the army of Asham? And the Prophet Sallallahu said, Alayka bi Sham. He said, go to Asham because it is the chosen place from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gathers the chosen one from his servants. But he says, if you refuse, then go to your Yemen. Go to Yemenikum and eat from its ponds. Eat from its, not ponds, eat from its pools eat from the pools, uh, drink, not drink, eat, but drink. Drink from the pools of Yemen because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted to me Asham and its people. Allah will take care of Asham and its people. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is encouraging people to go to Asham to be part of that. That being said, there's an important concept with regards to the, uh, the, the end of days. And that is a person does not try to impose their reality on the actual texts. 
So I don't look at the map right now and say, okay, I see that there are soldiers in Asham, and I definitely see that there are soldiers in Yemen, so this must be that there are soldiers in Al-Iraq right now that we're looking for. You don't try to create these scenarios. These are events that are going to happen, yes, but they're not initiated. And anytime people try to initiate these types of events, it ends up having disastrous consequences. Like one day, inshallah, we'll ask Sheikh Walid or Sheikh Kamar or any one of them to tell the story of Juhayman. This was a person who tried to claim him he was the Mahdi. And you can look up the story on YouTube in 1979 and they tried to take over the Kaaba. And they tried to, to, they tried to, they tried to create these events. And obviously he wasn't the Mahdi and it ended up being a, a complete massacre and disaster. So uh, the last thing that I, I'll, I'll mention is the, the famous hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Well, two things. Number one, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, He said, if the people of Asham become corrupt, then there is no goodness in you. So the people of Asham are actually a metric for the righteousness of the Ummah. Now, does that mean that in every time and place that the people of Asham are going to be perfect and the most righteous and all that type of stuff? No, that's not what it means. But it does mean that over the period of the Ummah, 1400 years, that the people of Asham are always going to be, like over the entire duration, they're always going to be of the best of this Ummah. And if you look at the events of this ummah, whether we're talking about the amount of scholars that came after Asham, or whether you look at the disasters that were stopped in Asham, the Crusaders were stopped in Asham, the Mongols were stopped in Asham, Saif al Din Qutus and the Battle of Ain Jalut, that was in Palestine. That is where the, the, the ravaging of the Mongols of the entire ummah, it came to stop at Ain Jalut in Palestine. Right? So that's where you have these moments. But also, Rasulullah says that there will never stop being a group from my ummah. They will be apparent upon the truth. They will not be harmed by those who forsake them, nor those who betray them, or those who go against them. They will be apparent upon the truth. And they said, they are in, and he said, they are in Beitul Maqdis wa Ahkanaf Beitul Maqdis. They are in Jerusalem and in the surrounding areas of Jerusalem. So there will always be a community from the believers in that region that are apparent upon the truth. If the whole world forsakes them, that won't change them. If the whole world goes against them, that won't change them. They'll be apparent upon that truth. And so it's really important for the Ummah that we look and we see who are these people what is their belief like? What is their worship like? What is their... Uh, I have a, a beautiful friend of mine who recently went on a, a medical tri a trip to uh, Gaza. And when he came back, he said, you know, um, he said the people in Gaza were telling him, he said, because he, he, he went to Medina right after and he went to Mecca to do Umrah. And they told him, they said, oh, you're going to Mecca? They said to him, they said, you know, Mecca is the land of ibadah. And they said, and Gaza is the land of shahada. So he said, you know, Mecca is the, the place of worship and Asham or Palestine is the place of shahada. But he said to us, he said, you know, even though there's a lot of shahada there, he said there's a lot of ibadah there too. And he started describing to us the ibadah of the people that he, that he saw a man whose legs are amputated, being brought into the, uh, you know, and, and he's uh, praying, you know. His tongue is, is, continues to be moist with the dhikr of Allah. People are waking up in the freezing cold. And I remember going to Palestine a couple of years ago in March, and what I remember is how cold it was. I could not purchase enough layers of clothes for the cold. And even the cold has baraka there. It was incredible. And yet you're seeing now we're in March or in April now. I mean, they just went through those incredible, um, you know, temperatures there. And he's telling us like this man wakes up every morning and they're trying to find water. They're making wudu with whatever water is available. And every morning nonstop, he's waking up the youth in these camps. As-salah, 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 nonstop, right? So in any case, 
the Prophet, what is their ibadah like? You learn, what is their ibadah like? What is their attachment to the dunya like? What is their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look like? Their tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look like? You learn from that. What is their, 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 uh, their uh, forgiveness of the ummah like? You know, I heard this qunut from Gaza a couple of days ago. It was a heartbreaking qunut, you know, the dua that they're making in taraweeh. And one of them, and I'll end with this, but what, one of the things that the guy was saying, he was saying, رَبَّنَا وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَأُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ You know that verse from Surah um, What Surah is that? Tahrim? Al-Hashr, okay. Yeah, it's in Surah Al-Hashr. So he's saying, Oh Allah, do not make in our hearts animosity, hatred towards the believers. إِنَّكَ رَأُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ and generally, this is being said about you know the people of the past, but I can't imagine, or I can't imagine very easily how disappointed the people of Gaza are in the entire Muslim world, right? And I could imagine that disappointment turning into hatred, like look at look at 1.6 billion people, and they can't stop us from being slaughtered like cattle. Don't make us have any rancor in our hearts for those who have believed. Right? So what does their forgiveness look like? What does their iman look like? All of that, inshallah ta'ala, is something to be studied. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to see Baytul Maqdis free and unoccupied. And all of Palestine, Allahumma ameen ajila ghayra ajila. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite our hearts and unite our words and, and make us of those who support uh, bringing relief to our brothers and sisters and not make us of those who forsake them. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khair. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad.